So, Chris, I'll thank you very much indeed for a really fascinating lecture, such elegant uh, science, and we really enjoyed listening to your, your successful work to date. Um, and thank you also for agreeing to, you know, after you've given your lecture, uh, submitting yourself to questioning. This by is the fun part. <laughs> 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 so, I guess the first question from us is, um, we spoke in the introduction about your industrial experience, and we just wondered how that industrial experience had affected or influenced your academic research. So I'm, I'm going to start this with a story, which is uh, sort of gives the background as to why I chose to, to do an industrial stint, if you will, before uh, an academic career. Um, and it goes back to a, an internship I had in my fourth year of graduate school. Um, that was preceded by an invitation to give uh, what was my first full-length lecture at a company. So DuPont um, sponsored a fellowship I had. A condition of the fellowship was to go and, and give this talk. And it was my first sort of big talk. I was very nervous. For the younger people in the room, there were no laptop computers. Um, my slides were overhead transparencies in a binder. And you didn't put them in your checked luggage because if your bag got lost, then, then you had to sort of make it up as you went along. Um, and I gave this talk, and people were really engaged, and I thought it was really good. And then I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a, a scientist there, a guy named Charlie Nakamura, who said, um, the reason for your research is all wrong. He was very direct. He said it exactly like that. <laughs> and he says, and then he said, don't get me wrong. I think what you're doing is interesting. And I think the scientific community is going to learn a lot from it. But you've motivated it by things that you think are useful in industry. And we just don't care about that. And I had three points, because every talk has to have like three main objectives or main reasons why. And he, he just sort of deconstructed them one by one. Uh, and I don't, I don't remember any more of the details of what was wrong, but he said, um, one was, he said, it used to be a problem, but we figured that out a long time ago. And because we don't publish as much, the academics haven't caught on to the fact that, that we solved it. I forget the second one. And the third one, he said, I'll give you that. That's a real problem. But it doesn't become a problem until you solve these other five problems first. So it doesn't really matter. Um, so I was humbled. Um, you know, I felt better that he said the work was good, right? <laughs> but he made it clear I didn't know what I was talking about. Uh, and so I'm an engineer by training. And I chose engineering because I like the problem-solving approach. I love taking from discovery-based biology and discovery-based biochemistry and putting that into, into practice for solving problems. And so I felt like I wanted the opportunity to be in industry, to learn what things really were important, what were some of the bottlenecks, um, and that they, it would better inform my academic career. So now this comes to answering the question, right? <laughs> which, is, which is what impact has it had? Um, so it, it did have an impact on that. So the choice of research problems was motivated by what I saw in industry and what I understood there. Um, it had a surprising impact on my teaching that I didn't expect because I found that I was able to say, here's why you need to know this. Or in some cases, I was able to say, okay, to be honest, you're never going to actually do this if you're at a company because you won't have time, but you need to be able to understand it so that if it's presented to you, you know what to do with it. Um, so the, the impact on the teaching was, was a little bit surprising, but I think... The, the biggest take home ended up being a cultural difference, which is that, and I see this push um, in a lot of academic circles to try to get graduate education and postdoctoral training to look more like what happens in companies. And having been in a company, I think that's a mistake. And the reason I think it's a mistake is because companies have to be structured to minimize failure. Right? Plain and simple, you, you, have, you, know, you need to, and I was in the pharmaceutical industry where the mantra was fail fast. So failure was okay, but you had to fail as quickly as possible so that you could move on. Um, whereas in graduate school, I think some of the best lasting lessons come from mistakes. 
and learning how to recover from those mistakes. Now, my, the example I always gave that is when I was in graduate school, um, I think it's a little harder to do it these days with the way the equipment is, but we would run a lot of gels analyzing DNA, and everybody ran a gel backwards once, but usually not twice. <laughs> because if you ran it backwards once, and you went away for half an hour and you came back expecting it to be all ready for you. And instead, your dye bands were gone because you had just run everything off into the running buffer. You never, you were much more careful. I won't say you never made that mistake again, but you were much less likely to make that mistake again because you had to figure out how to, how to get around it. So I, I think the approach to academic research needs to not lose sight of the fact that there will be mistakes. A lot of wonderful projects I've had have come from, not from what I would describe as mistakes, but from things that we observed that we weren't expecting, that had I been in a company, I would have said, well, that's not critical path because that's not what we're looking for, and we would have missed something. Um, so you know, that's a long answer to say it certainly has influenced the kinds of projects that I choose, but it's made me much more aware of the critical role that education plays in academic research that I think is, is important to be different than what happens in, in a company. How do you select or choose uh, which molecule you want to produce in a particular setting? Are you influenced by industry, by research paper, or you just... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Dream big. And... So, so this is a, it's a great question because the other influence that I had from industry was that when I worked at Merck, part of what, I worked in a number of different areas, but one of the areas was in biocatalysis. So using enzymes to do chemical conversions where the objective was to identify some enzyme to work on some new structure all the time. So this traditional way of thinking about enzymes with the lock and key, where one substrate goes with one enzyme, um, that, that was just not even a, a consideration. So I liked that idea very much and decided to use that as the basis for what I would do for my independent academic research, and that was to create these pathways just based on chemistry. But then the question is, you know, where does that come from? And it turns out going to sleep with like the chemical catalog underneath your pillow doesn't, doesn't help. There's, there's too many choices there. You don't, you don't get any inspiration that way. Um, I was fortunate. So the glucaric acid molecule that I talked about, we selected that one because in August of 2004, the U.S. Department of Energy published a report called Top Value Added Chemicals from Biomass. And the objective of that report was to first recognize that as we looked at more biomass utilization, that biofuels were important, but they were low value. And if we really wanted to be able to compete, there would be some need to take biomass as a feedstock and convert it to something that had higher value than fuels did. Um, and so they created this report to try to identify what those molecules were, and importantly, to try to identify ones that could serve as platform chemicals to make other things. Um, and so that was actually our first source in terms of looking for inspiration. Um, everything since then has been driven either by industry. So we had a, a biofuels project that was funded by a company, by Shell, where they had a very sort of narrowly tailored, set, narrowly tailored set of requirements for a molecule that they thought would be a good biofuel. So five to eight carbons, one oxygen uh, as, as a primary alcohol, um, and at least one branch point. So that became the, the target for one set of things. A lot of the work that we're doing now, I'm doing in collaboration with a colleague uh, who's a polymer scientist. Uh, and in that case, our objective is to be able to design polymers that are naturally degradable, um, but also biomass resource. And so we work collaboratively and a little bit iteratively for us to identify, based on structural parameters he gives us, we identify compounds we think can be made by biology. His group then tests their performance um, as a polymer. And then we have another collaborator who's an expert on the environmental fate of, um, of compounds. And so that's actually driven by a very specific desire to have monomers for polymer synthesis. Um, occasionally, we've, we've done some things. Um, I gave the, the glycerate as an example where we weren't driven by glycerate so much, but it was more of 
what are things that we can convert galactronic acid or gluconic acid to. So occasionally it's driven more by the substrates than the products. Um, but these days it's largely influenced by what we hear from um, companies or from, not even just from companies, but if we're at conferences and the kinds of problems we hear being talked about in the community, trying to identify places where we think we can make a difference. And, I, and the last thing I'll say there is that we still are not at the point where um, biology can effectively compete with a lot of chemical manufacturing. And so we do try to look at whether or not a particular target is already available for 50 cents a kilo um, because that's not something that we're going to be able to produce with biology. So those are, that's, that's the economic consideration that would help us to further uh, narrow down the set of things that we would look at. My, my next question is, is around uh, early career scientists. So one of the, one of the core values of, 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 the, of our society as a learning society is to promote and elevate and to celebrate our early career scientists. And you know, from what you've told us and what we know of your own research group, that's clearly value, those are clearly values that are well aligned with, with yours. So um, we have some PhD students in the audience and no doubt some watching the live stream. What would be the advice that you would give to those students? One piece of advice you might give those. Okay, first let's see hands. Who are PhD students? There we go, okay. I was gonna guess, but I didn't wanna make any assumptions. Um, so I, I, can I, can I give more than one piece of yeah, advice? Of course, of course. Um, the, f the first piece of advice I would give is don't be too hard on yourself, right? Um, and one of the things I, I, so again, I said I like to tell stories. Um, my academic career, my industrial career was great. The transition from an industrial career to an academic career um, was, was tricky, it was a little bit choppy for me, um, and I did not enjoy it for the first few years. It's hard to believe, because it's been 18 years since then. Um, and it took me a while, and one day I realized that part of what made it so difficult is that everything that went wrong, so if a paper wasn't accepted, or a proposal wasn't funded, um, I took that much harder than the successes. Right, so, so I found that the happiness I got from things going well was less happy than the sadness I felt from things going, going badly. I see, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Right? <laughs> so, and I think a lot of us do that. So I realize that, that the, the way to summarize that is just being too hard on yourself, that we have to celebrate our successes and we have to recognize that many of the failures are not our failures. They're just sort of, for funding, you know, it doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It means that the government doesn't have enough money. No one's government has enough money to fund all of the fundable ideas that come around. So having the perspective to, to not be too difficult, right, and to, to beat yourself up for the, for the failures, that's the first thing. The second thing I would say, and it's tied into that, which is to recognize what we're trying to do is difficult. Right, meaning advanced science. Um, and in general, things that are worthwhile are hard. Right? And, and the easy stuff has been done because it was easy. So the only thing that's left, for every generation, the only thing that's left are the things that are harder than the things before because every generation does the stuff that's now easy for, the, for their generation. My advisor talked about, um, he, he did his postdoc with Arthur Kornberg, and the first thing every postdoc had to do when they joined the lab was purify restriction enzymes. Because you couldn't buy them, right? There's no, like, we don't make people purify restriction enzymes now because you can get 50 of them from any catalog anywhere. Um, so that used to be hard for them, and it's not. That, right, it, now that's easy for us. So recognize that we're always at the leading edge, and that is by definition difficult because it's the stuff that we don't know. The stuff that we already know how to do, we've done. We're all trying to do things that are, that are more difficult than that. Um, and the last thing that I would say is just decide what it is that you want to do as well as who you want to be as you do it. Um, I, what I appreciate I, about the generation that's behind my generation is the insistence to consider the whole person. I don't think I had that when I, I had an advisor who was that as a person, but the culture in which I went to graduate school in did not consider the whole person. Um, 
And so the idea that you know, we should care about happiness <laughs> <laughs> or balance um, and have an opportunity to, to do something other than work. Um, again, I had an advisor who was very supportive of that, and I've always tried to translate that into my own group, but it's only in the last five or six years where it feels like that's just sort of taken for granted, that, that you have to consider the whole human. So that means you get to choose not just what you want to do, but who you want to be as you do it, um, and make that an intentional choice. Right? Don't sort of fall into it because it's what you see everybody else doing. Look at how you see people living their professional lives and decide, is that how you want to do it or choose to do it, to do it differently? Is that good advice? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Cristela. So my question is, which are the great challenges for applied microbiology? Yeah. So I, um, I, I will preface this by saying I tell people all the time, um, I cannot see the future. If I could, I would have purchased a winning lottery ticket <laughs> and we'd have this conversation on my yacht. Right? So, so that means everything I say after this, take it with the grain of salt of someone who can't predict the future. What it's, I think this is the most exciting time to be an applied microbiologist, because I do think, and, and Professor Temis set it up beautifully, there are so many different ways that we can think about microbiology making a tremendous difference. Um, I, you know, if I if I look at, at my own work, um, and and I'm not saying that's the most important thing, but I start with the fact that we have to reduce our dependence on fossil feedstocks. We have to. Um, I, I keep saying I'm a chemical engineer. There's a fundamental thing in chemical engineering called a, a mass balance or a material balance. And if, if we believe that fossil fuels actually came from fossils, then the rate at which they were produced is a lot less than the rate at which we consume them. Okay? So that means even if you took the greenhouse gas emissions argument out of the equation, it's not going to last forever. Right? And now when you add the climate effects, the urgency to figure out how to live in a world that's not so utterly dependent upon fossil feedstocks, um, is, it's, it, I, it's hard to express just how serious of a, of a problem this is. Um, and I always talk about as well, mass versus energy. And so traditionally, you've, we've talked about being able to displace diesel fuel and to power airplanes or to power trucks or to power our automobiles. Um, that's all being used for energy. And we can get very creative about finding alternative non-carbon sources of energy. But we also use the fossil carbon for mass. A tremendous amount of our basic platform chemicals that go into pharmaceutical synthesis, that go into textile manufacturing, that go into all sorts of materials comes from fossil-derived feedstocks. Um, and I go back to the first slide, which is biology is already really, really good at doing chemistry. And I think the potential is still largely untapped of using biology to help to address that part of the sustainability problem, which is how do we get the materials that we need for quality of life, and in many cases for life-saving purposes, from something that's really renewable and really sustainable. And I don't see any other way but biology to really do that. Um, and then the second I'll mention is around this idea of being able to maximally utilize waste material. Um, and we can put waste in, in air quotes, but essentially it is about trying to create a truly circular path or circular economy for materials. And the reason I'm really excited about the potential of microbiology for this is that you don't, in the environment, you don't find one microbe. If you take a soil sample, you're not going to find one species of Pseudomonas and that's it. Right? You find these really complex communities. Um, and if you, know, if you go to your, your neighborhood compost bin, there's a lot of stuff that ends up being broken down to essentially you know, to minerals by these very complex communities. And so we already know the potential of biology, especially as you look at microbial communities, is the potential is already there to do a lot of what we want biology to do. We have to figure out how to actually translate that into something that's scalable 
and can make a difference. And because I actually think that it's going to end up being microbial communities that are the answer to this, we've got to have really, really good microbiology, right? We have to have fundamental understanding of what's happening. We have to have understanding about the relationships. Is it mutualism? Is it competition? Is it all these different ways that you get interactions between different species to be able to understand how do we actually leverage that? Um, so I, those are the two that I will mention. The, actually, there's a third one that I have to mention, which is carbon capture. I still think you know, we, we have to, we're not going to get to a place where we are completely able to eliminate industrial processes or um, power plants that are emitting large amounts or producing, I won't say emitting, producing large amounts of CO2. And there are both biological and non-biological routes to that. Um, and I, I don't really have a, a, a preference between them, to be honest. I think we have to be able to do it. Um, but I think there's potential there to think about innovative ways to have biology be used for carbon capture as well. Because that then allows us to still have the fossil base for the things that we can't figure out how to displace, but not have all the negative environmental consequences of just emitting massive amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere. But the young people have to solve these problems, <laughs> right? We need to keep bringing up more and more generations of, of, of people who, I get nods, okay, there you go. She's gonna take care of it for us. <laughs> Christelle, thank you very much indeed. That concludes our question and answer session. But I just want to uh, thank you again. It's been lovely to talk to you and thank you for your you know, great insights and advice for, for the younger uh, generation of scientists. And also um, thanks to, to Ken, you know, the, the architect of this uh, award series. So thank you very much, Ken. Um, and I think we'll just show our appreciation for both Ken and our uh, recipient of our award this evening, Christella. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much.